Hi everyone! Well, everyone on YouTube, I'm trying to get Instagram Live to work for me. It's having trouble connecting. Um, but I'd like to stream on both places, so I appreciate your patience, YouTube folks, for um, hanging in here with me while I attempt to connect on Instagram TV. So this is the second studio stream here at La Bruxelles for the year 2021. And excitingly, it's the first YouTube stream that happens with our new president. We had an inauguration here in the US yesterday, and now our new leaders are President Biden and um, Vice President Kamala Harris, and I'm very excited about that. So thank you for joining me. I see Cam from Hat no Hats just joined over on Instagram TV. And there's somebody here on YouTube, but it doesn't tell me who has joined. So hello, say hi in the chat if you like. I do get that scroll on my feed here. Um, today, I'm gonna be working on some millinery trims made of fur felt and wool felt as well um, for hat making. And I'm glad that Kim was able, or is able to join us over on Instagram TV. Um, because I was really initially inspired by a project that she did with this uh, when she was taking my millinery class and did some research into different types of felt trims that could be created from the trimmings. Like when you block a hat with a hat body and you trim away parts of the brim that are extraneous, you're not gonna use them. Um, and then you can use those, you can repurpose them to create like a hat band of the same felt, little cut out flowers and leaves and such. And I'm going to be making some felt trims that um, they're not offcuts from hat bodies. They are offcuts from the flat fur felt that I've been using, which if you're on um, if you're on the YouTube stream, you've got the landscape view and you can see Zelda over here wearing a 1940s reproduction flat felt hat. Let me move her into the view of people who are watching on YouTube. So she has this awesome black flat fur felt hat that I made. Talked about this in the stream last week where I was working on trim possibilities for it. And then over my shoulder here, you can kind of see it on, on IGTV as well. There is a flat felt uh, sort of, I call it a glamorous crumple 1940s hat. So I have some offcuts from those pieces of fur felt, which that comes, um, it's flat yardage. So it's unlike a hat body where your offcuts are curved or circular pieces that you've trimmed away from the edge of the brim. Well, in this case, most of my flat felt is coming from um, vintage 1950s fur felt skirts that I've bought on eBay. And perhaps for some reason they're damaged. They can't be worn as garments anymore. In the case of this black one that Zelda is wearing, the skirt arrived and had some bleach damage. So there were areas where it was bleached out in a sort of like tan color. So you wouldn't wear it as a skirt anymore because obviously this person had sat in bleach at some point, but I was able to cut around that to make this beautiful hat. Um, and I have some extra pieces from around that that we're gonna be working on today. I'm gonna do two different, well, I guess you can do all sorts of things with these two different techniques that I'm gonna be showing you today. But here I have a couple of examples that this one, I went ahead, let's see if you can see it on YouTube, you can see it on Instagram TV. I went ahead and finished one of these fur felt feathers um, so that you can see what the process results in. And then I'm gonna make some more. I have several uh, set up in various stages of completion to work on and, and to talk about as I'm working on them. Oh. That was the thing I meant to do. I was gonna set a timer on my watch because last time I set an alarm on Alexa and then she didn't hear me when I told her to shut up and it was a huge pain in the butt. So 
I'm trying the watch timer this time. I'll get it down. One of these weeks I will figure out something that works and I'll stick with it. Um, but so I'm making these for felt. Um, well, it doesn't have to be fur felt. It could be wool felt. It could be cotton. Well, cotton felt is too thick. It could be rayon felt. Um, I just recently found out through somebody um, responding to a video on my YouTube channel. Um, they mentioned having worked with cotton and rayon blend felt. And so I, I searched around and I found a vendor that's selling bamboo rayon blend felt in a, a whole range of colors. And so I've ordered some pieces of it, hopefully coming soon, postal delays and all, um, to experiment with because I'm, I'm just always interested in felt from new, um, from new sources. And this commenter on the YouTube video was um, particularly interested in the idea of, of animal-free felt and looking for an alternative to the synthetic felts, like the polyester felt that you buy at the craft store, um, which I have some of to make a feather, just to compare it to these other ones. This one is fur felt, as is this one. Um, and I'm hoping that there will be some sort of interesting um, properties with this bamboo uh, rayon blend felt that just, oh, I see Arlene has joined us in the YouTube chat. Hello, yay. Um, actually, you know, she tends to sign on both places for the different views and stuff. So she might be in IGTV as well. Um, we're making fur felt feathers right now. We're also going to make another felt trim. But I've, I've completed completed this one and got this one almost done. Um, so you can see what it looks like far along in the process. But what it looks like earlier. So I have, let's take this for example. As you see that. This is that variegated felt if you watched this stream or if you watched my uh, video on comparing wool felt to cotton felt. Um, I had some flat pieces of wool felt that had been felted and mottled dyed. And um, this is one of them that I thought it's, it's model dyed shades of brown and I thought that might make an interesting feather. And this one I have gotten it just to the first step in the process where I have folded it and stitched uh, about an eighth of an inch away um, along the edge so I have something kind of like a channel. Now I also have um, this piece of the brown felt. I stitched that channel around a wire so that I could bend my eventual feather and it would take, in, take shapes um, but this one here does not have a wire, so it'll be more floppy. This blue one does have a wire. This black one does not have a wire. So, you know, it, you can choose to make it with whatever sort of stabilization you'd like down this central sort of pseudo quill shaft that you've got. Um, narrow millinery wire is good. And I also have one that I'm going to be working on, this red one, where what's inside the, the spine of the feather is this, see if you can see that, this um, braided round cording. It's actually a shoelace for like military boots, this one is, but this type of, of round cross section braid um, or cord can be a, 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 a channel down the, like, like piping, you know, like cording that goes into piping trim. Um, you can put that down the middle for some really interesting dimensionality, which is what I've done on this red one. But let's go back to this one. That's the first one I'm going to work on where we have it in strip form and I've stitched my channel I pre-stitched that before this stream because my uh, sewing machine is in that room. My studio has sort of um, expanded to fill the entire upstairs of our house. You know, I mean, like we have two guest bedrooms with the idea that pre-COVID or post-COVID, I guess now, um, the idea was that, you know, 
Chris has family, I have family, we could host Christmas and put them all up. You know, my family, my parents would stay in this room and his uh, sister or niece or, you know, whoever would stay in the other room. Um, and, and we do still have, you know, hopes that that will exist as a possibility someday. But right now, all three rooms are my sewing room or my, my sewing floor of the house. Um, so the other bedroom is my cutting room. I have um, a large piece of cardboard that sort of forms my cutting table in there. And um, the middle room, which is a loft room, has my sewing machine, storage for supplies, an ironing station, um, mostly storage in a bunch of different like chest of drawers and so forth. And then this room is my millinery studio and also where I um, do programming of my course site. So I have now, if you can see, which you may not be able to see very well because the next step of this, which I can't do because I'd have to go in the other room, is to use my steam iron to press this feather shape open like this black one has been pressed open and like this gray one has been pressed open. Um, so ones that I will be cutting down to, to this profile, I guess, this, this shape, um, I will then have to iron them, uh, steam them open, and, and then come back and do the next step of the process. But my goal in the studio stream today is to show you each step of the process, at least to some degree, and by the end of it, I will wind up with some finished feathers. That's the hope. And I also have another technique I want to show you. And, you know, I'm only 12 minutes in, so I actually have high hopes that I will complete both of the things I hope to do in the stream today. Um, so can you see this feather now? It, it's, it's going to be sort of like a... I'm thinking of it as the length of maybe a pheasant feather, how they're very long, but not very wide. And, and the color scheme is, is kind of similar. A pheasant feather has black sort of stripe-like elements to it, which this does not have. But because this wool felt was variegated in the dyeing process, um, modeled, that's a vocabulary word for my dye class students, which probably none of them are watching this because... I can't stand over a dye vat in my upstairs studio. Like a lot of that class is, is being online delivery that I film on site in the dye shop when nobody's around. Um, or lectures that I just talk about vocabulary words. Like the most recent one, I think the most recent one that I uploaded um, um, this past Monday was um, just vocabulary words pertaining to dyeing, of which modeling was one of them, which is an uneven dye job, um, which is undesirable most of the time in a fashion or an industrial sense. You know, if you're if you're dyeing yardage that's then going to be rolled on a bolt and sold at Joann's, unless it's a specialty fabric that is supposed to look hand dyed, it you want a uniform, as as level of a dye job as you can get. Level means uniformity of color absorption. Modeling means variegation. And from a stage perspective, see, I'm, I'm going to give you some dissertations, uh, some diversions about uh, theatrical dyeing, because that's on my mind with being my class this semester as I work on these millinery trims. And this modeled fur felt is going to be an excellent feather. In the theater, we love it when it's modeled because it looks so much richer under stage lights. Level dyeing just winds up looking kind of flat unless there's some other visual uh, interest to the textile. Like maybe it has a sort of a pebbly texture to the fabric or uh, reflectivity like a satin uh, or a velvet, you know, where you have highlights and lowlights that are just present by virtue of the nature of the weave. Um, so, you know, um, that is to say that model dyeing is 
undesirable in some circumstances, but theatrically speaking, you are often going for this. And it's a plus in terms of my, my felt uh, feather here, because I think it's going to look a lot more natural of a feather than something like this homogenous gray level dyed piece of felt. Like, even if you look at this feather that I made as my sample beforehand, this is from the flat felt that I made my very first version of this hat out of that was um, the felt itself. Well, I have a piece of it here. This, this has not been cut up. And if, if you look at it closely, it's sort of heathered. Like it's, it's slate blue and navy blue that's, that's blended together in, in the felt itself. And that gives it a level of visual interest when it becomes a feather that looks much more interesting on stage under stage lights than a feather like this gray one, which I will trim it up. But even once it looks this much like a feather, it's still not necessarily going to look like a feather. So this, we had a piece of it. I stitched my channel. I pressed it open with steam so that it wants to basically lay kind of flat. It's more like a leaf. And this technique is such that you can, Arlene says it looks textured, the blue feather. It does. That's any time that you can have variegation in color on the surface that you're working with, and not just in millinery, but any aspect of theatrical costume, it's going to just look more visually satisfying on stage. Um, this technique can also be used to make leaves. I, I didn't think about it in enough time to cut more of these out of the variegated green felt that I have, but I would probably do that for next week's stream unless something comes up that I have to work on instead. So I'm gonna start trimming this little gray guy, um, guy, this little gray feather, so that you can see um, what happens once you make it into the shape steam it open and then trim on an actual feather these little fluttery fluffy elements are called flues f-l-u-e flues and um you know like when you think about an ostrich feather an ostrich feather has really lots of long floaty flues that wave around in the air and, and give the feather its um, sort of visual interest, really, I guess. I'm cutting my flues on this short one. So this is about as long as my hand, and I have small hands. Um, I'm cutting my flues about, mm, I would say, a, a fat eighth of an inch. They're very narrow. Um, I mean, they're not like hairs, but they're not big and thick. And I, on the blue one, I, I cut them as uniformly as I could. I'm not doing it with a rotary cutter and a, a uh, oh, I lost my word, a rotary cutter and a ruler though, because I, I'm not interested in uniformity. Like if something is supposed to approximate a, a natural object like a feather I mean that's a thing that grows on a bird it, there's there's rules to it but it's not like it's been manufactured by a computer you know it you Ooh, sorry my my uh, scissor malfunctioned here as we get down to the end it becomes then you have to make a sort of a, a aesthetic decision of, of how close to the bottom are you gonna really go with this and on the blue one I made the choice to have I'm gonna put my glasses back on so you can see this on the blue one I made the choice to have a couple of wider flues here at the bottom like most of the flues are about a fat eighth of an inch and then the the last two or three on the blue one or more like a quarter of an inch, um, which also gives it a, a, a sense of naturalism. Flues want have barbs on them and they want to hang together. They want to be sleek, especially uh, not so much on ostrich tail feathers, but definitely on feathers like pheasant 
feathers, um, goose feathers, turkey feathers. They want to cling together and you can rip them apart and then you get, you know, openness like I have here in my felt feather flues. But they want to go back together. And, and I was actually thinking the next one that I cut beyond this gray one, I would vary the thickness of my little flues to make it seem more natural and, and whether whether I liked the visual look of that better. Uh, my, my hope is by the end of this stream that I will have a pile of lots of different kinds of felt feathers to choose from um, for millinery trims moving forward into the future. Oh, I forgot to look. I saw that somebody had left a comment. Oh, Arlene left a comment in the YouTube chat. Could you fake model it by random stipple sewing on the felt? You could, yes. Um, I think you'd have to do that after you trimmed it though, unless you were stippling little tacks because then you wouldn't you be cutting your own thread? You know, I don't know. I, I like that idea. Um, and and I like the idea also of, of stippling it with paint and uh, particularly airbrush paint that is very thin and it, it, it works nicely on um, textiles in terms of uh, being a nice um, sort of compromise between being thick enough that you get the color on the surface, but not imparting so much heaviness to alter the hand of the fabric, which is a problem with painting. Why, why you choose to dye instead of to paint is to maintain the original hand of the fabric, um, which is always desirable in garment making and, and theatrical costume making because the costume designer has chosen that fabric because it is the texture that they want the garment to be made out of. And if you spray paint it blue and your silk chiffon suddenly becomes really crisp and, and, and organza-like, then that's problematic. Um, anyway, so I think you, I think you could do some interesting stuff, um, Especially if you're, I think that the original uh, brown variegated wool that I have here um, was dyed with acid dyes. And um, I think you could do some neat stuff stippling with that. And then um, it's, instead of leaving it in the bath, which like an acid dye needs to um, be present at a certain temperature with acid involved, usually uh white vinegar, acetic acid, can be citric acid. Um, I mean, I guess it could be any kind of acid, but those are the most common too. Um, but in addition to like cooking it in a bath where it's submerged and your modeling comes out less controlled, you can, oh no, I cut one of my flues off. Uh-oh. Well, that'll just make it look like this bird had a bit of an accident. Um, I think you could stipple with thickened acid dye on a sponge and then steam the whole thing to get the dye to bond. Um, you'd have to mix your acid, your thickened acid dye with the, the acid content already present. Um, but that is, um, that's a technique for costume painting that's pretty common. I actually have a woman coming to speak to my class who does that variety of painting with acid dyes on nylon, um, stretch body suits and, and dance wear for Broadway shows. And I'm um, really excited to have her come and talk to us. I've worked with her before in New York. She's a great lady, Margaret Piaf. So here is my gray feather. Can you see that in both places? My gray feather, which this gray felt, this particular piece of gray felt, is synthetic polyester craft felt um, that just happens to be kind of a, a lovely color, I thought. And um, I, I really like how it has turned out as a feather, I have to admit. Like, I, I would almost never choose to use this felt to sew a hat from because it it something about the visual quality of the polyester felt um, 
it just looks cheesy and contemporary to my eye. But I, I, I do feel like this, um, this little gray felt feather has turned out quite nice. And, and I like that, unlike the wool one, or unlike, I think there's fur content in this, um, it, this blue one sort of maintains the, the shape that it was in, the, the flues that I've cut into it still have quite a lot of stability. And there's a wire down the center, center of it, so I could uh, sort of twist my feather so that the flues splay out a little bit more, but they want to remain mostly sleek. Whereas this one that's synthetic, they, they kind of want to go all over the place which is nice for, um, like if we were doing a show like My Fair Lady when she's still a flower vendor and she's a poor woman, but she wants to, uh, to still adorn herself with used clothes, but she's trimmed them out with her own real flowers or whatever. I feel like this sort of sad gray felt feather could be a really nice, um, a really nice trim on a hat where your character needed to to be sort of down on their luck, but still have some pride in their appearance or some interest in their own um, sartorial expression. Now I have two finished felt feathers. I'm going to put them up here to get them out of the way. Um, what am I doing for time? Oh yeah, I'm good. Okay, so I want to keep moving forward with uh, felt ma feather making. Oh, here's one that I did with the brown felt um, that's ready to be trimmed into flues. I did some with different um, different support down the spines, like this blue one where you can see I have the cording sticking out the bottom of it and the felt just ends right there and then this black part is that sort of rounded lacing cording that you lace up military boots with um and for this one i i i tacked across the tip so that i i could pull on it and get some wavy curvature in that feather later once i cut the flues into it I'm really sort of experimenting with this technique. Um, Kim, who's in the IGTV, who's watching on IGTV, um, did a whole project in my class on this sort of felt feather making. And she made several different ones with different cores and stuff. But, and, and I was oh, so interested in it, but it was her project. And so it was something that it's like, I thought to myself, well, I will come back to that and revisit it someday. And I have not so far, but I am very excited to have the opportunity to do it now. And on this one, what I'm doing is instead of uniformly cutting all of my flues at a fat eighth in width, I'm making some of them a quarter of an inch wide and some of them three eighths of an inch wide. And we'll see if I seem to think that that's a, a nice look. I really think you could do some great leaves with this technique as well. And I would be interested to see, you know, uh, for the feather you, you stitch the one tuck down the center or the one channel that has either a wire or a cord in it. But I wonder if you were doing felt leaves, if you could find a way to, you know, the way the veins of a leaf sort of mimic the branches of a tree. And if you could find a way to, to put your tucks into it so that you had your central shaft of the vein of the leaf but then you would also have a bunch of other offshoots into the other arm. Like say you were doing an oak leaf, for example, which is kind of like a glove. Um, 
So could you do that? Anyway, I have to cut one side of this blue feather that has the cord down the center of it. Um, oh, someone's saying something. My project maybe, but oh, that's very sweet. Kim saying in um, the IGTV. Oh, I, I totally can't see. My eyes are so bad. Oh, she did do a lot of research in the Playmakers costume stock vintage hats that we had there. So, correct. Okay. I was inspired by Kim's project. Kim was inspired by antique and vintage hats that she found in, in the collection of Playmakers Repertory Company. So, yes, let us give credit where credit is due that it originally comes back to that. Which, speaking of the hats that are in the collection at Playmakers that Kim just mentioned on IGTV, um, one of my current graduate students... Um, did a, a fantastic project where, um, actually it's Athena, Kim. You've, you've been working with her on reproducing blocks of your own vintage hats. And she found a vintage hat in our archive that was made by this famous milliner of the 30s and 40s, um, Monsieur Tapé, I think. He had a French last name, or at least he pronounced it in a French way. And um, it was one of these like sweet little 1940s hats that's kind of based on a mannish hat style, but then it's completely reworked like this crazy witch's Homburg over here. Um, and Athena scanned this tape hat that she found in our um, costume collection at Playmakers and then 3D printed the, she 3D scanned it and then 3D printed the block and she's writing it up. Uh, we're hoping to submit that paper to Dress Magazine, which is the um, the Journal of the Costume Society of America. It's like a, a juried publication for scholars of costume history and design and technology and such. They've really started a, an outreach campaign trying to get more costumers involved um, in their organization. So I think we have a pretty good shot at getting this piece on the Tape Hat reproduction published. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm digressing. I know last week I said that I thought I might be working on some As You Like It costumes in this studio stream. Um, and Sad Face, Actors' Equity denied our request to, or they denied our proposal for how we wanted to uh, produce that show. That it, and you know, it's it's sad, but it's also like it's being prudent. It is the safe thing to do. Thank you very much, Actors' Equity, uh, for analyzing it and and recognizing that that we're not in a good place with the vaccine rollout. We're not in a good place with um, our our numbers, our COVID positive numbers here in North Carolina, in the U.S. in general. Um, so what we're doing, we had already started making the costumes because we had to. You know, the production process is such that the shops have to start making things well before the actors get signed on to start rehearsing. You know, we have a cast list, but they don't show up yet um, to be in the hall to work with the director. So we had started, you know, we had decided... Uh, which people were going to make which clothes. One of my graduate students, Lauren Woods, is serving as an on-site costume crafts artisan, so she's running the dye shop. Um, and it also was, you know, it was good because it was providing our graduate students with some stage costumes to make. So, because Actors' Equity turned us down, they're still going to have a remote workshop where the cast workshops the existing script because you know you do Shakespeare and really it's like the director reads Shakespeare and cuts it down to whatever sort of script they want it to be because it's in the public domain. The cast is going to work with that script for the next three weeks starting next week I think or maybe this week and um, we're going to fit the clothes that, that are made to order. The ones that we're, we're making the whole thing made to measure we're going to fit those mock up and then build them in the actual fabric to the point that you would be doing final finishing. You'd set the hems, you know, um, and then in August, 
when hopefully our COVID numbers will be better and our vaccine rollout will be successful, we will be able to then produce this show. Of course, our third year graduate students will have graduated by then, but when what is left is finishing an existing garment, then our rising third years, rising second years, and incoming first years can finish up those garments and, and it'll it'll be kind of like in the professional world where like I was on the Hamilton team, I showed up, the clothes were already half made, I helped finish them and then I had to leave before a loadout. So, you know, it's not, you don't get to, to really own the making of something from start to finish in professional costume production. So it's it's a good example of that for them. Now, now that I've finished my, my flu cutting on this blue, the second blue feather that has the lace cording down the center of it, the lacing, um, we, we can compare the the floppiness, I guess, the, the motion that, that is in place for, for this type of feather with, you know, where's my one that, this other blue one has a wire down it. So it doesn't flop at all. Like this one, we get good motion. This one, we get no motion. Floppy motion, no motion. But it's not like, this one doesn't have a wire and it's totally droopy. So our cord imparts some stability, not so droopy that we want to put it on, you know, Eliza Doolittle's hat before she comes out of the gutter. But this has more, um, more play, more interest, visual interest than this one, which is very stable. This one is, 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 you know, the uptight Queen Victoria or, you know, Maggie Smith <laughs> would play the role that that feather goes on her hat. But I really like this one. And this one I also, if you can, I don't know if you can tell, you can tell on YouTube for sure that I variegated the width of my flues. And I, I really like this one. I feel like this one is so far my favorite of the blue one. And and of course I, I love my, my crumply sad gray one. Um, what are we at for time? Okay, we're past the 30 minute mark. So maybe I will, um, actually, let me quickly, this is not a, a paid sponsorship, but it is, I showed these last week and I wanna show them again, these head size ovals from Seams and Laser Beams that I got. Um, I was part of the, the development of this process in um, talking with, uh, the, the man who own, has launched this company, Randy Hendley, is an alumni of our graduate program. And um, I am not remotely getting paid in a sponsorship to, to talk about this in my stream, but um, he consulted with me about what, what these would be like, what would be helpful for milliners who are um, doing custom pattern making of uh, stitched hats or buckram hats. And you always want a head size oval as your base that you're starting your pattern from. And so I have smallest is 21 inches here and the rest of last time, last week, I only had through uh, 23 inches because that was our first collection idea. You know, half sizes, 21, 21 and a half, 22, 22 and a half and 23. And that launched and, but then there, was valid discussion about why doesn't it go up further than that? Because head sizes are growing, you know, and, and I can corroborate that the last year, the last year that I was making hats for playmakers, I had an actor with a 25, an actor with a 25 and a half and an actor with a 26 inch head. So we went up to 26 and, <laughs> and I, I love it because you can compare the 21 to the 26 and, and really see the difference in the head size shape, you know, how, how it's so important to start with the appropriate sized oval to then draft your, or drape your pattern from. And um, I'm just so excited to have this set. Now I have half sizes 21 through 26 and I'm really looking forward to making hats with those. Um, I put a link to his Etsy shop in the description of the stream. So if you're interested in them, you can click on that and get some for yourself too. But um, 
I just love them. And it was fun to sort of consult. Here's Randy. He's in there. Long ovals coming soon. Yes. <laughs> so Randy's in responding in the chat in, in IGTV saying that long ovals are coming soon. And let me quickly uh, demonstrate what that means. So this is a standard oval, which has to do with the ratio from front to back versus side to side. And this is sort of the, the average head size perimeter. Most people have a, a, a fairly proportional oval for their head. And when Randy says long ovals are coming soon, he's talking about people who have narrower heads to where the distance from side to side is less, but the distance from front to back is longer. So they might be the same head size measurement as a 21, but if you imagine this stretched out and skinnier, you really need to start with the perimeter that closely matches the head size of the wearer or else you're gonna get weird buckling. Like if somebody, it wouldn't be the 21, but let's say you have someone 23 and a half. If they're 23 and a half, but they're narrower and longer, then if you try to put a hat with this head size opening on it, it's gonna pull, push against it at the front and the back, and then it's gonna buckle at the sides where it has to pull in to fill that empty space because it is 22 or 23 and a half. It's just not this perimeter for the head size opening. So that's really exciting that, that Randy's gonna be doing long ovals as well um, in terms of really customizing your hat pattern for the wearer that you're, that you're making it for. Um, of course, if you're doing blocked hats, that's a whole different perspective because then you need something that is the shape of the head and, and that's, a, that's a whole video itself, I guess. Let me just move on. <laughs> Um, and I want to, I only have 22 minutes left, so I want to move on from the feathers and talk about another, um, another felt trim, self trim option that you can do that, um, here is an example. I went ahead and made one, um, because then I'm going to cut some more from flat so you can see how this happens. So this is kind of like... If I hold it like this, it's like a tassel of loops. And if I hold it like this, it's like a flower of loops. You know, it, it there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this. And, and when Kim did this research project in my class, she did one that I really loved where she cut her rectangle really long so that these loops wound up being about six inches long and then pinned it on the inside of a head size opening of a hat so that it hung down, I'll put it on Zelda here, so that it hung down from the hat like some hair. It was so fun. Um, so this is one I made right before this uh, studio stream. And I have a couple of other pieces out here of, here's the green felt that I'm gonna make some leaves out of, which I'd thought of that before this stream. Um, and this is about the size of the piece of felt that I used to make this loopy tassel from felt. And what you need to do, like if you've ever, have you ever done, if you've ever done, one of those braided leather belts where you cut three slits in the leather but you leave it attached at the top and the bottom and then the way you fold it through itself creates the braid of the leather belt well i guess you could do that with fur felt and now that i've said that out loud i'm, I'm excited to try that um but really i was just talking about how you cut that leather to get that to happen because you cut your felt in the same way and you're going to cut slits that go not end to end, but like about five eighths to three quarters of an inch in, cutting a slit up to the top. And I guess if I were at work and I had access to a rotary cutter and a cutting mat, that would probably be the easiest and quickest way to do this. I don't have that here. Um, and before I started this video, I came up with this idea for how to do it which involved, you 
fold one end of the um, oh, long someone else. Oh, Creative Costume Academy just joined. That's Trisha. Hi, Trisha. Woo. Um, folding it up, taking my sharp scissors. You really need sharp scissors to do this too. You you, you don't want ones that are gonna chew up your felt. Um, fold it about ah, an inch and a quarter, and then I'm going to cut some the beginnings of my um, slices in the felt. But I'm just, you know, it's I'm cutting about five-eighths of an inch. I wish I were doing this on a stream is is nice, but I actually should probably do this as a video because then I could show this cutting close up with like a camera mounted on a headband so you could see what I'm doing. But in a moment, I will finish and then I will hold it up and you'll be able to see that way. Okay, so so now I've, I've with it folded over, I've cut my my little slits along here so now this looks sort of like a, a medieval pair of pumpkin hose or something I've got my little slits open and that gives me a starting point from which to cut the rest of the strip so i just love this variegated wool you know i bought it like years and years ago at Wilting conference, I believe it was. Um, it was maybe it was NC Fiber. It was something that was held here in the North Carolina Triangle, and I think I had to go to Raleigh to attend it. But there was like all kinds of quilting fabric and notions and interesting sewing stuff, and pretty sure it was quilting, but it uh, maybe it was just fiber art. Um, and this one. Uh, vendor had pieces of variegated dyed wool felt somewhat larger than like when you buy a square of craft felt at like Michael's and it's synthetic and that's like what that's kind of eight by ten I think it's almost like a sheet of paper in size and this vendor that I bought these from their size was slightly larger than that. It was, um, well, I'll show you. So this was the short side of it, this distance here. And so that's 11, uh, maybe they were 11 by 17. You know, that it was, it was a good sized piece. Um, it was not necessarily something that you could construct a flat felt hat out of. But it was definitely something that you could obviously construct felt trim out of. So I bought them. And they have stayed, ironically, they have stayed in the teaching tools work box for dye class ever since because of the model dyeing. Um, and this semester I had uh, the manager at Playmakers I went and picked up that course box. It's normally in the dye shop and I just like haul it out while I'm teaching class and, you know, pick out something that I need to illustrate my lecture for that day. Well, that can't happen this semester because everything has to get filmed ahead of time. Um, and in going through it, I've, I've found these and, and, you know, ordinarily I would po pass them around for people to look at when we're talking about model dyeing versus level dyeing and visual interest on stage and all the stuff that I've sort of already been talking about in this stream. Um, but it inspired me, like having them, just having them here, I thought, you know, I really need to do something with those finally. And I'm excited to be able to be doing that in this um, studio stream today. So this part is kind of tedious and I do think this would be way faster and actually more accurate and, and nice looking if I was doing it with a rotary cutter and a straight edge on a cutting mat at the shop. But you can see 
you can start to see what's happening with the felt is sort of becoming kind of like spaghetti that then once this turns into I would probably do another pom-pom sort of thing with this one um, they'll they'll be nice loops like that oh Arlene says could be um, fiber could have been fiber fest um, I think it was fiber fest now that you mention it um, she says rug hooker, hookers often like to use model dye felt um, and now that now that you mentioned that I, I I am pretty sure that that's where it was and I actually think it was in um, a, a, a vendor that was largely catering to rug makers now that now that you've mentioned it that's that's probably what it was um, Kind of want to go back to making the feathers i gotta say like <laughs> i love the look of this once you complete it um but the doing of it without access to a rotary blade is not my favorite um but you know what i'll do i will i will finish this green one just for the sake of, of finishing it and and showing you what it looks like before and after it becomes a little loopy poof and then I will return to my feathers. I'm sad not to be working on As You Like It this semester, um, only because the designs for it are amazing. Um, one of my grad students posted something on um, posted a shot on Instagram of she's making she's making a wedding dress there's two wedding dresses in as you like it if you're unfamiliar with the play and um so obviously like two of our third year graduate students are making those wedding dresses and it's set in the 1920s I think I mentioned it's early in the 20s like maybe 1923 22 um and they're the, the research image for one of the wedding dresses, I think it was, oh, I'm not going to name the designer because I'll get it wrong, but I've definitely seen the dress before in the collection at the Met. And it is sort of encrusted with all of these, like, it's, it's like a dusting of little ribbon flowers that have collected at the edges of the scallops on the overdress. And um, so she posted on um, Instagram a picture of some of the ribbon flower samples that she had started creating, which that's happening in tandem with the grad student who's serving as a crafts artisan because, of course, everybody that's getting married needs a headdress. So she's making the headdresses. And I, I'm just so excited for them that they get to collaborate on trying to figure out what those ribbon flowers look like and who makes how many of which because there's some on the the dress need to also be on the veil slash headdress um it's a veil but like it's really more like those 1920s headband shapes that um sit very low on the forehead and they're fairly wide um I think of them mostly in the context of like showgirls really like when when you think about flapper headbands those are usually fairly narrow or at least the popular conception of what they were is that they were fairly narrow um and this is early enough in the 20s that the the shapes are sort of a hybrid between the teens and the 20s and so the the shapes of the teens clothes and hats are just wacky you know if you are a uh, fan of costume history or fashion history you know that the what's going on in the 19 teens well worldwide what's going on in the 19 teens is is world war one 
But what's going on with fashion is madness. And, you know, maybe that has something to do with the fact that World War I is what's going on in the teens. I don't know. Um, but they just really kind of, they went for all kinds of weird shapes. And um, it, it makes that transition from the teens to the 20s really um, interesting. So I'm sad that I am not part of the making of those uh, craft shapes for the headdresses and such, but I certainly do not begrudge my students the opportunity to do such things, particularly because they're in grad school in the midst of a pandemic and the opportunities are few and far between. I will be doing this potentially for the rest of my life and I will be able to make many cool hats in many future productions. Even if those productions are, even if live theater just totally doesn't come back from this, well, whatever, I'll be making them for Dragon Con or something, like, or video games, I, whatever. Um, so it's not my last chance to make some cool headdresses from the 19 teens slash 20s. Um, but I, I was I was made a little, uh, not homesick, work sick maybe? Like, I, I was a little bit nostalgic for being able to, to, work on the stuff in the shop with them and, and collaborate on these designs because they are so cool. Um, so I have my, I, I just started doing this and I, and I forgot to explain to you what, what happens next. So I've trimmed my rectangle of felt into spaghetti with two strips at the end that stabilize the whole entire thing into a single piece. And I folded them up on themselves, or I folded it up on itself, end to end, so that then I have all of these loopy hang downs. You love this, yes. Well, I love this. Y'all may not. And now on one end, I'm going to start rolling it into like, uh, let's say kind of like a cinnamon roll or... Um, if you've ever made prosciutto roll, <laughs> um, I'm rolling it up on itself. And then what I'm going to do to stabilize it, like I did with this black one, it's, that's just got, uh, two quilting pins stuck through and through to stabilize it. Sticking it all the way through. And then sometime post stream or perhaps next week, I don't know. Um, I would then thread up a needle and, and stabilize this by sewing this. See if you can see that roll there, this little felt jelly roll that I have. Um, I'll stabilize that. And in fact, I might put a little cap on it depending on what I choose to do with this to trim something with it if what I choose to do actually now that I've rolled it up <laughs> I kind of want to um, pin it into this hat that's on Zelda here um, in the way that I mentioned back a while ago how Kim pinned hers or stitched hers actually maybe into a hat from the inside so that it became kind of like hair of the wearer. Um, now I'm, I'm really drawn to that idea. So I'm, ju I'm just going to pin it in here really quick so we can look at that and see what we think. Especially because Zelda is my, my moody hat mannequin here who always looks like somebody just died. And, you know, I get it. Like, you don't want a hat... Have you ever seen those hat mannequins where they're like got really stylized features and they're like, I can't stand looking at hats on those things because I'm so, too distracted by the overly enthusiastic facial expression. <laughs> so how about this for awesome? So I don't know if you can see that she would have like this weird green fringe hanging out of the hat that would be kind of like a hairstyle except she'd also have her hairstyle there um i 
I loved how like that was really surreal to me in a in a sort of chaparelli esque like design element that that you look at it and you're like it's fashionable but it's bizarre <laughs> I I just love that so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it on Zelda here you if you're on YouTube you can really see her a lot better than if you're on um. You can't see her on Instagram. Sorry about that. But I really like this green hair. <laughs> this green felt hair at, uh, aspect that's going on. Uh, and actually, I might have to... Um, that might be how I choose to finish this hat out. It, it is so... It, it's such a striking and bizarre choice. Uh, but I'm, I want to go back to... I have... Let's see. Oh, I only have four minutes left to my stream. Maybe I can finish one more feather. Let me try to get one more feather out. Um, God, like, like every week, I always have such ambitious plans for what I think I can get done in a stream. And then I just don't even finish half of it sometimes. Like I really thought I could make, like, I have maybe 20 feathers set up in various degrees of completion that I thought I would make progress on. And I'm going to wind up with one, two, three, four. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I don't actually have any um, any purpose for these feathers other than just adding to my millinery trim options. You know, uh, sometimes it's fun to just, um, especially with the, the handcrafts involved in millinery trimming, you know, making f fabric flowers, like I mentioned, my grad students are doing for the as you like it costumes, um, sometimes it's it's a good meditative challenge and a, a good exercising of your skills to to just spend a little time on a technique like this, making something like fur felt flat felt feathers, and then those go into your sort of trim collection. I mean it's. It's good to, to remember this technique as something that could be employed in the trimming of a felt hat that you are working on, but it's also good to just have these things so that when you make a hat and you're trying to figure out how to trim it out, you dump your box and you're like, oh yeah, I have all these cool felt feathers that I made. And maybe you need to make a couple more considering how you are going to trim it out, but it's it's the inspiration of having it. It's one thing to know that you can do this, and then it's having it around to remind yourself how awesome it is. So, I, oh, that's good. Look at this black one. So this black one is fur felt that, that this hat is made out of here that Zelda is wearing. And I did not put a wire down the center of it. I just, um, I just let it be what it is and and now it really it's 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 got some really excellent floppiness to it that that we also saw in this this gray synthetic felt one and this one has some weight that's imparted to it from the cord down the central quill that's not present in this black one the black one is is a little more has a little more shimmy to it and and um the cord gives some some structure that that the the felt can twist around on that one much in the way that the original one that had a wire down it we can really twist that felt feather around and get an interesting spiral out of it now that spiral is is a great design element and um it's not going to happen with without some stabilizer down the central quill. So it's good that we've got a wire in this one. And I, I think I have a couple more that I stitched a wire into that they could have this sort of wind chime spiral to them that you don't get from a felt feather that has no stabilization down the center tuck uh, that forms the quill. Um, I see that it is past, it's 4.04, 04, so that's that's past the time that I normally stop my studio stream. Um, 
thank you for joining me today. The first studio stream in the presidency of, of Biden. Pretty excited about the, the, um, the inauguration yesterday. That was uh, such fun to watch in terms of um, in terms of change for our country, but also the fashion was great. Um, my, my watch alarm is saying stop. Yes, I get it. Um, I'm going to do this as, as much as I can every Thursday afternoon. There are a couple of Thursdays, which I'll announce in, in advance if I'm not going to do the stream, because we're starting to interview prospective graduate students for this fall or fall of 2021. And there are two Thursdays in which we have a graduate student who's visiting, um, obviously not physically visiting, but we'll be Zooming all day in different, you know, I Zoom with them. They present their portfolio in a Zoom. They have a lunch Zoom with the students. Um, so there's one afternoon or two afternoons where I will be in a portfolio presentation. And instead of a, a studio stream, my goal is that if I can't stream on a Thursday, I will have video, extra video content that goes up on the YouTube channel. So, um, that's not next week though. Next week, I will be back here. I will probably be making more felt uh, hat ornaments, including hopefully leaves now that I've thought about with this uh, green uh, felt hair here, which Arlene says it's just wicked, joking about um, Elphaba, if you're familiar with the Wicked Witch musical. Um, so come on back. I'm here every Thursday afternoon. It looks like we're gonna keep doing millinery even though I'm teaching dye class, but my my extemporaneous talking may veer into things to do with dyeing, like with the variegation of dye in these two pieces of wool felt that I was manipulating, um, just because that's what I'm, I'm teaching online for my graduate students. So thank you so much for coming. I'm gonna end the stream.